Good morning. My name is Thomas Hope, and I'm a radiologist and nuclear medicine physician at UCSF. And today I get the opportunity to talk to you about functional imaging and the role of PSMA PET in prostate cancer. Now, there are a lot of radio tracers that are used to image and stage patients with prostate cancer, and it can sometimes be confusing. Uh, FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, is a sugar analog, sometimes called a sugar pet, which can be used, uh, particularly in patients with later stage disease, and it can be prognostic, but it's not very helpful in localizing small volume disease. On the other side here, we have sodium fluoride, which can be used to visualize osseous metastatic disease, and choline, as well as another uh, amino acid rich as flucyclovine, is also used frequently in prostate cancer. But the newer generation of agents is PSMA, which we will talk about here. So PSMA stands for prostate-specific membrane antigen. It is a protein that lives on the membrane of prostate cancer cells and is overexpressed in prostate cancer compared to other tissues in the body. And so by targeting this protein, we can actually see where pro proteins are that are in prostate cancer membranes and localize prostate cancer metastases fairly accurately. Now at UCSF, we've been using a molecule called gallium-68 PSMA11. Uh, this is the diagram, the molecular structure of that molecule. And on one half of the molecule is a chelator. This is the part of the molecule that binds to gallium-68. And on the other side of the molecule is a urea motif. This is a small uh, motif that will bind to PSMA and gives this molecule the specificity for prostate cancer. We then put gallium-68 into this molecule and inject it into patients. So, we take this molecule, we inject it into the arm of a patient. That molecule then circulates throughout the body of the patient and binds to the PSMA molecule on the surface of tumor cells. And once it gets within the tumor cells, the gallium will then decay, giving off radioactivity that can be imaged using a PET scanner, positron emission tomography scanner. That results in images like this, which can localize prostate cancer in patients. So in patients, you can see their salivary glands, which is normal. There's liver uptake. The highest uptake is usually in the kidneys and the urine that comes out in the bladder and a little bit of splenic uptake. But in this case, you can see there's a small subcentimeter uh, left periaortic lymph node, right here a retroperitoneal lymph node, which has uptake, which is clearly seen on the PSMA PET. It would be very hard, if not impossible, to determine that that was metastatic disease without the PSMA PET to show you that there's uptake consistent with metastatic prostate cancer. And this is really where PSMA PET shines. I'm hopeful that in a year or two, we'll get to a place where staging with prostate cancer will be done primarily with PSMA PET, and no longer will patients be getting a bone scan, a CT scan, or an MRI. You get a single imaging study to stage the entirety of a patient, both bone and and soft tissue staging. Now at UCSF, over the last number of years, as everyone in the audience probably knows, we've done a lot of work with gallium PSMA 11, and we were fortunate enough in December of last year to obtain approval of gallium 68 PSMA 11 by the FDA. This was done in a collaborative effort with the University of California, Los Angeles, known as the only current PSMA radio trace that's FDA approved. What's interesting is we were able to get it approved in both initial staging, that first bullet point there, as well as at the time of biochemical recurrence, or when a PSA starts to rise after definitive therapy. And that's in distinction to other drugs such as flucyclovine or choline, which are only FDA approved in the setting of biochemical recurrence. So this is really bringing PET imaging to the initial staging as well, which is wonderful. Now, I do have to take a second to compare PSMA to flucyclovine. I should note that flucyclovine is widely available in the United States. It's reimbursed by Medicare, and it's currently the standard imaging modality for prostate cancer patients. Moving forward, we anticipate that obviously PSMA PET will replace flucyclovine, but it's not yet widely available, and so the majority of patients in the country who have prostate cancer will be undergoing a flucyclovine PET. Now in this case, you can clearly see that there's focal uptake here, this top row on the flucyclovine PET and a right pelvic sidewall lymph node. 
and you can also see it on the PSMA PET. But you can see the uptake in the tumor here on the fusiclovine is 3.9 compared to the adjacent background, which is about 1 to 1.2. There's about a 3 to 1 ratio between tumor to background. In the PSMA PET, that tumor to background ratio is more like 50. And that's what makes it much easier to localize and see disease, is how much more of the radiotracer goes into the tumor and how much less there is in the background. That contrast between tumor and background allows people like me, radiologists and nuclear medicine physicians, to localize disease. In this case, both of the imaging studies localizes disease. In this study, in a different patient, you can see in the right seminal vesicle there's very subtle uptake in the fluciclovine PET. Now there is a higher uptake in the tumor compared to background, a little less than a 2 to 1 ratio. But the PSMA PET has much higher focal uptake, which is much easier to visualize. In spite of the fact that there's also activity in the bladder at the same time, you can clearly see this local recurrence much better with PSMA PET. Now this was studied prospectively. The UCLA group did a wonderful job doing a head-to-head -head comparison of fluciclovine, which is also called FACBC, or an orange in this chart, and PSMA in patients after radical prostatectomy. And they showed that fluciclovine had about half of the detection rate of PSMA. And maybe more importantly, PSMA PET saw disease in metastases and nodes at a much, much higher rate than fluciclovine, while fluciclovine primarily saw disease in the prostate bed. This is T2. Uh, in the prostate bed here in where the primary tumor was. Now the other thing to note is that it's not very easy to receive, uh, interpret a fusiclovine PET. And there's a statistic called a Cohen's Kappa. If you have perfect agreement, uh, you would get a 1. If you have no agreement between multiple readers, you have a 0. So the closer to 0 the number is, the more disagreement there is between readers. The closer to 1 you are, the more agreement there is between readers. And in this study in Lancet Ecology, there showed to be a lot higher agreement when interpreting a PSMA PET compared to a fusiclovine PET. Now, it should also be noted that PSMA-11 is not the only radio tracer out there. There's actually more than just these six. There's a whole family of these PSMA-targeted radio tracers that bind to PSMA. And it's really important to note that there's for example, DCFPYL down here, which will hopefully become FDA approved soon. And they all share this same motif, this urea motif, which gives them a very similar specificity and sensitivity for detecting prostate cancer. So I consider these more like a class. And it's important that we get these FDA approved so that we can get more of these radio tracers available to patients. Now, the differences in these radio tracers result really primarily in a difference in biodistribution. So PSMA-11 here, the one we use at UCSF, and DCF-PYL, the third one over here, are very similar. But this one, PSMA-1007, which is currently in phase three clinical trials, has a very different biodistribution. You can see there's much more activity in the liver and much less activity in the urine. And this allows potentially for better detection of local disease, but overall they all have a very similar sensitivity and actually in head-to-head -head studies PSMA-1007 haven't been shown to be better than PSMA-11 or DCF-PYL, and they all seem to function nearly identically. Now it should be noted that PSMA-11, we obtained FDA approval in December of last year, and there's actually a kit that should be approved later this month to help get PSMA-11 more widely available. And DCF-PYL, they submitted their application to the FDA in September of last year, and we're very hopeful that this drug will get FDA approved at the end of this month. So it could be actually uh, approved very soon. And DCF-PYL will be much more widely available because it's fluorinated, it can be distributed, and made in much larger quantities. So this will hopefully uh, be the drug that most people are imaged with in the United States states. Now it should be noted that the results of PSMA PET really changes the management of disease. So if you think about where disease is, patients can have a negative PSMA PET, and that's this left column here, and you can see the majority of those patients actually had their management changed towards surveillance uh, instead of doing active treatment. Or patients can have nodal disease uh, in the pelvis or in the prostate bed. And the majority of those patients were getting local therapy or radiation therapy to the pelvic nodes or the oligometastases that were visualized on the PSMA PET. And then also you can have metastatic disease. And in these patients, instead of getting targeted treatment or active surveillance, these patients had a change in management towards systemic therapy. And PSMA PET, based on the distribution of disease, has a has huge impact in the therapies that patients are getting in prostate cancer. 
Now, in particular, I want to focus on biochemical recurrence after radical prostatectomy briefly. Uh, we did a study here at UCSF looking at patients who had a low PSA after radical prostatectomy and did PSMA PETS in 125 patients who had a PSA less than 2. And about half of those patients had PSMA positive disease. But of those 125 patients, 30% of them had disease that would be missed by standard radiation therapy fields. So you can see in this patient, the green outline here is the standard radiation therapy fields. And here's a node just posterior to those fields that we treated with external beam radiation. And this wouldn't have been treated if we hadn't used PSMA PET to localize that disease prior to radiation therapy. And so if you look at the rates of recurrence after uh, salvage radiotherapy, it's about 30%. And most likely that's because radiation therapy missed the sites of disease. Radiation therapy actually works very, very well as long as a radiation oncologist knows where to aim the external beam. And so this is where we are really hopeful that PSMA PET can really improve the outcome of patients and prevent biochemical persistence and recurrence after therapy. And there's actually now starting to be literature that really suggests that molecular imaging like this guiding radiation therapy can really improve outcomes. So in summary, Overall, PSMA PET is really the, the best imaging study to stage patients and detect metastatic prostate cancer. I think really importantly, PSMA PET has a large impact on clinical care, and in particular, as I pointed out in that last slide, with radiation therapy planning. And excitingly, we got gallium PSMA 11 approved at UCSF, and there's one more NDA pending for gallium PSMA 11 for a kit to make it more widely available. But really, it's DCFPYL that will become much more widely available and hopefully provide access to this really wonderful imaging study to more patients. So thank you very much for listening.